The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. And welcome to this week's Crashing Glass podcast. I am Holly Hurley, your host, here with my co-host, Jill Henley. Hi, you, Jill. Hi there, how you doing? Great, and this week we have a very special special guest, if you will, special, a special guest, we have a special guest. Um, this week our special guest is uh, Zoe Hillenmeyer. Hello, Miss Zoe. Hi there. So Zoe, uh, tell us, this week's uh, episode is Mad Chicks after the show Mad Men, because we're going to talk all about advertisements. Basically, all the Super Bowl advertisements were up online in advance this year, which means that even though we're recording this 30 minutes before the Super Bowl kickoff, we're able to talk about some of the ads and basically the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so obviously, I want to talk a little bit about Zoe's background and why we chose her today. So Zoe, tell us a little bit about your marketing background. Sure. Well, um, I'm currently full-time enrolled as an MBA student at Olin School of Business, but prior to this, I was the marketing manager for Freeman's Auction House in Philadelphia, where I ran all of the advertising and social media PR for 12 different departments for America's oldest auction house. Prior to that, I was working on advertising outreach for a art nonprofit in St. Louis. Prior to that, I ran the branding for an art internet startup in India. And before that, I got my BFA in visual design, at, also at Washington University in St. Louis. So long history of art and visuals. Awesome. So you're perfect for this. But this is uh, Super Bowl Sunday is all about visual, isn't it? It is. Yeah, that and uh, I have a Manning connection because I'm from Indiana. So I would have preferred Peyton, but I'll go with Eli. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got one of them at least. So, right. yes, as we're recording on Super Bowl Sunday, and it's Patriots, Giants kicking off in, like Holly said, less than an hour. And it is so interesting, Zoe, to have you with your experience with branding and marketing and stuff because we're super, the Super Bowl, it's fascinating because it's obviously, you know, such a big, it is the big game. It is a big day. And it's the game itself, the football, is almost, you know, equally as important as the commercials. So do you want to speak a little bit more? Why do you think that's come about? Well, I think it's, you know, the advertisements have gotten so creative and that I think it's become, it's become a platform for fantastic artwork, really. I mean, it's similar to, you think about trailers that run before a movie. That's where they put all the resources to make something to really hook people in. And it's become the same thing. People know that on Super Bowl Sunday, you're going to see the best of the best, and everybody will tune in for the best. It's true. It's kind of weird because I find people who aren't even interested in the football, like there have been years I didn't care about either of the teams playing, but especially before all the ads were on the internet in advance, I used to watch Super Bowl. Basically, everybody during the commercials would get up and go get food, and I'm like, shh, I want to watch these. <laughs> And people love creativity, and I think this is when you see the most creative, in my opinion, the most creative ad work of the year comes out on the Super Bowl. It can be edgier because it's not directly related to sales like Christmas time. Oh, uh, okay. Slightly edgier audience. And I think you get the most creative work around the Super Bowl, and people feel like they can go for it, and they're spending a huge amount of money for that ad time, so they really put everything forth. And people love creative work, so... Yeah, they do. And they, you're right. There is such it is such an edginess factor. I've watched about, I don't know, half dozen or so commercials already today. As Holly mentioned, they now, I don't know if it's 2012 is the first year or if maybe last year as well, they put them up early so that you can watch some of them ahead of time. And there's definitely some controversial ones and just that craziness they can really let loose. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And what I love about these ones they put online is it's pretty amazing. They, you know, they can only air 30 seconds of a, of a commercial frequently, but some of these online are two, two and a half minutes long. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like an investment to go on and watch them all. It's like you, it will take you almost as long to get through all the Super Bowl commercials as it will to, like, watch a movie, you know? It's kind sure. of crazy. Because I was definitely trying to get through a bunch this week, and I was like, I ran out of time. Like, I mean, we're going to talk about maybe four or five, but, like, there was no way we could get through them all, you know? Mm. So I thought so that was never... cool. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. 
No, I, I was going to go into uh, basically talking about, you know, speaking of advertising, the Super Bowl made a decision back in 2009 that you can't say Super Bowl in your promotional stuff. Like these advertisements, you know, you used to when you saw a Super Bowl advertisement, a lot of times it would have Super Bowl content in it. Like it would say the person was on their way to the Super Bowl or they were having a Super Bowl party. But now you don't see that anymore. And a big part of that is that uh, now they're making advertisers pay really high licensing fees to use the term Super Bowl. Yeah, it's. I, I'm curious to know if if that's because the NFL thinks they they just they deserve to have that that extra cash coming into them, you know, because it's their word. I did go on to the Public Citizen. It's it seems to be a, a a Public Citizen blog type of thing, consumer law and policy blog, and they said um, the National Football League now aggressively policies the use of its trademarks, including its trademark in the use of the name Super Bowl. And they send threatening communication back to anybody who dares to advertise their products by encouraging, you know, their products, consumption of their products during or in conjunction with the Super Bowl, you know, and so that they, they don't want them using that name to their benefit, right? Other corporations, it's almost like a competitive thing. You know, I think it's really, I really want to get behind them on this because I can respect creative license and branding license, but I think they're shooting themselves in the foot here. I mean, Super Bowl hype is part of why they can charge so much for the advertising fees that they get. And to not let a local grocery store advertise something like, come get your Super Bowl deal. I mean, I think that's, I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. I Holly, what do you think? Oh, no, I agree, because I think it's taken away some of the frenzy behind the Super Bowl. Like, I don't know about you guys. Actually, I know Zoe has, Zoe has plans, and I know, Jill, because you're in Patriots country, you definitely have plans <laughs> for the Super Bowl. But, I mean, I don't care about either of the teams. So, yeah, maybe I'm going to watch it at home with John, but, like, I could really care less because I used to get really excited about the Super Bowl. I used to get involved with, like, the frenzy of it. But you can watch all the ads online now. No, the commercials are awesome and creative around the Super Bowl, but they exist outside of the Super Bowl. You don't have to watch the Super Bowl to see them. So, mm-hmm. like, I don't really care. It's not two teams I care about. It's not fun and overblown like it used to be. And I think a big part of that is they took around all of that creative aura, you know, a lot of times, the they always, we always talk about in branding how uh, a product will create a vibe or will create an emotional response that'll sometimes outgrow it. You know, like Viagra is a is a you know really good example of that. You know, men they became like a party drug in New York. You could say like, oh, he's a Viagra guy. If a guy like married a younger woman, you know, and it took on a life of its own, either for or against the product. But you have to factor that into your branding. I think the Super Bowl is shooting themselves in the foot. I think they're taking away from the excitement for people who would otherwise watch the game anyway just because of the excitement, just to go to the party, you know? And, 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 and on top of that, Holly, I think they've actually also outlawed you can't show a show the game to an audience on a screen larger than 55 inches diagonally or any screen if viewers have to pay to watch the game. So I just think they've killed the opportunity for people to, I mean, I understand that they're trying to make sure people don't monetize all of this, but I think they're killing some of the frenzy here. And in a way that's totally unnecessary, they make plenty of money off the Super Bowl. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. And I guess with that, we should get into some of these ads here. So Jill, do you have a favorite out of the ones that we watched this week? Well, I think so. And Zoe, you already answered my one main question was that I did notice on the ads that had been posted on different um, companies' websites that the length of them, many of them are a minute, a minute and a half. I guess that's because they have that, they, you know, they can just have it as long as they want and tell a story. But then when it comes to during the commercials, or will they mostly be back down to 30 seconds? Um, I'm guessing that most of those are going to be 30-second hooks. I don't know that anybody can afford to run four two-minute you know, advertisements. Right. I, 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 mean, I would say, I think probably adding on to that, um, they're probably a lot of companies have tried new ad campaigns where you watch like a, you watch the hook as you called it Zoe on television. And then you, they tell you at the bottom, like go to YouTube to see the rest of this. Right. Yeah. right. So I that's think a, that's a go daddy style too. Doesn't go daddy's hooked people in or well, hooked men in by showing some, you know, pretty edgy, flashy ads and then ha- hooking them into their website. Totally. Oh, and then good. what you do is you essentially pay for 30 seconds of advertising, but you're getting the benefit of if people are interested in the hook, 
you end up being able to advertise to them for two minutes and 30 seconds. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, GoDaddy, actually, I'm glad you brought that up, Jill, because we are on a, you know, on a ladies, uh, ladies talking kind of podcast. And, (laughs) you know, you mentioned that 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 particular advertisement appeals to men. But let me be honest, like when it comes up in class, I don't know a woman in the room who doesn't remember. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You always know it's for GoDaddy. You kind of think it's funny. Yeah. And I, I don't even know, like, I don't know how I feel about it. Like, you know, as a woman, I'm like, wow, talk about, like, sexualizing something. But I think they did it so cleverly that I'm yes. kind of for it. I, I like it. I and Actually, it hooked me. So I, maybe it was last Super Bowl, possibly, that I, I think it was, because that's when they had the they had those the two women, and I can only come up with Don, Donica Patrick's name right now, but the other one is the, the very, the Jillian, Jillian Michaels. Jillian Michaels, yeah. Okay, I was going to say she's the, the trainer. And they had the, I think it was the Double D, comer, the double D uh, theme, and it hooked me right in, and I went to the website, and I was like, i got to see what, what are they going to do next? <laughs> So they are sexualized, but they're sexy and they seem to work. Yeah, I mean, I think it's. I think that's a good. Actually, that is one of the examples, Jill. I'm. I'm glad that that came up because that's one of the examples people always say of a really successful Super Bowl ad campaign. Yeah, it was targeted. You remember exactly what it's for, and it's appropriate for the crowd that's going to be watching the Super Bowl. Even the women who are who may be watching it and be kind of appalled, but guess what? They're still going to the website. Yeah, and I wasn't appalled. I was just fascinated <laughs> with it. So now going to the, some of the brand new ones, one of my favorites that I watched this week was the Volkswagen, the Volkswagen one with the dog who has to get into shape. And so I just thought, I thought as I was watching it, it was going to be just about the dog and the car, you know, and keeping up with chasing the car. But as it turns out, it has this whole Star Wars ending that just really I kind of was very surprised. Like I, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. Um, and I, so I wondered what you guys thought about that one. Yeah. I mean, I thought that one, I, I thought that was very clever and nicely done. What I thought was interesting is among a lot of these advertisements, the play into either uh, last year's Super Bowl advertisements or right. in the case of the old spice commercial playing into a different product line altogether and I think that that's actually, I think it's quite clever. It's, it's something about creating a world and letting people kind of enter that world. And I think it creates connectivity for people. I also think, um, actually, for those of you who don't know, the Old Spice commercials this year are Terry Crews, who's, I mean, he's, he's been in a number of things. He's a comedic actor. Uh, he, was an Indio- he played the president in Idiocracy. He was, uh, he's one of the Expendables in the Expendables, if that gives you an idea of the kind of movies he does. And uh, essentially, you have a product, like one of the commercials that is on, up on uh, Old Spice website right now, is it's a commercial for the bounce dryer bars or the dryer bars that stick inside the um, the, the uh, dryer you can tell I don't do the laundry in my house um, <laughs> yeah, and then right. Terry you stick them in the dryer and they they are like a softener right but yes, they stay in is. the dryer for a period of time right exactly I'm like you know you put them in the thing that dries the clothes and, <laughs> but anyway in the commercial Terry Cruz comes busting in on a uh, on like a jet ski and yeah. basically what PNG has done is Zoe was talking about and this was very controversial there were a lot of stories written up on this in ad week and other marketing uh, outlets about is this a good thing or a bad thing is this causing more recognizability for the for Old Spice, is it cannibalizing Bounce, or is it cannibalizing whatever products he busts in on, or is it good for both? And as Zoe said, you know, the big chance you take with these storytelling commercials that kind of shout back to one another is are you expanding the brand or are you cannibalizing yourself? Because I also think, like, when I saw the commercial with the dog, I thought it was adorable. And then it went back to the commercial that I really loved from last year, which was Mart, which was actually statistically one of the most popular commercials from last year's Super Bowl, you know, with the little uh, Darth Vader kid. Right. And I was like, this has just gone on too long. I could see these being two separate commercials, but watching them all together, I was really rooting for the dog, and I was really rooting yeah. for the But now I forgot what this commercial was for anyway. Like, I totally well, I think- uh, I think it'll be interesting to see what part of the dog commercial they put on during the bowl. Whether the alien portion is just the online portion or whether that's an active part of the ad. I'm not sure. We'll see. And I'm also wondering, will they split those up? You know, will they do like the dog in the first half and then the end of the dog in the second half? I don't know. And that could be quite, I think that could be quite funny if they run it as two separate ads, actually. Like to be continued kind of thing. 
<laughs> it, to, like during the Super Bowl, a lot of times they have those, right? They stop and then they continue it during the latter part of the game. Yeah. Which, and, again, but, is only good for the Super Bowl. Like, I think, again, with, like, sort of uh, making your advertisers pay to use the name Super Bowl, like, people stay around, stick around for the second half sometimes just to see the second half of the commercial. Right. Right? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, but I will be curious, though, to see how that pl- pl- plays out because I kind of liked the story of it. Did you, guys, uh, did you guys get a chance to watch the Chevrolet ones? Chevrolet is my favorite, hands down. Yeah. Hands down. When I was saying earlier that I think that the Super Bowl brings out the highest in creativity, I mean, I thought the Chevrolet, especially the, um, oh gosh, what's the name of this car? Sonic. The Sonic. I mean, the Sonic doing skydiving, the Sonic playing music, (laughs) the Sonic doing a kick back flip or whatever. Come on. Like, this is amazing creativity. This is... I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. No, I agree. I was watching that just going, this is so cool. Like, I don't, I'm not really a Chevy fan, but I think these commercials just took it to another level in such a memorable way. And really, I think appealed to, and I know this sounds silly, but everybody's trying to appeal to like the millennials or whatever. Like, oh, yeah. I, thought, I mean, I was like, dude, I get this. Like people young kids yeah. younger than me will get this. This is fun. It's active. I just, I, and it's create, like, I like it when these companies decide to make something happen that's beyond flashy. I mean, it takes hard work to figure out how to make a car skydive. I mean, it really does. And I think that there's something a millennial connects to with that says, God, they must be really creative, good problem solvers. I mean, if you can figure out how to make a car skydive you could probably figure out how to make a pretty great car um, <laughs> you know i think that they're they're adventurous i i think it displays everything good and it also you know to the same point earlier talking about how the connectivity it's indicating a world beyond the commercial basically all the work that goes into making a car skydive and likely you know it looked like that kick flip part maybe you could even go watch it so these uh-huh. things could have been news stunts. I mean, the PR possibilities off of those kind of stunts is is killer. So you think that the actual content of the commercial, you know, what the car is doing, may lend people to think, "Wow, this is a quality company who knows how to how, how to build a solid car." <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, and, and and who's willing to try new things and bring me a product that lives like I do? I mean. Yeah. So another one of the Chevrolet Super Bowl um, bits is the 2012 Mayan apocalypse. I love that. Um, I love that. It was great. And two things about it that I picked up, you know, that really stuck out. One is that, well, the the Twinkies, you know, so (laughs) Twinkies. I want to throw that out to Zoe and ask about that sort of double, that sort of double advertising, you know, that product placement within a commercial. I hadn't seen that, you know, hadn't really seen that before, a, you know, different product. But my other thing I'll say is that I have taken several um, acting for commercial classes. And a lot of times the copy that you get and you're reading it, and these are products that, that you know, that you, that are, these are real commercials that the copy, they're old commercials, but you know, ivory soap and surf detergent and CVS picture place, things like that. And when you're reading the copy, you're like, oh, this is just so stiff sounding. And how, how could you ever deliver that and make it sound like natural, like you're talking to a real person, you know, because that's what commercial acting is. You're you're supposed to be having a conversation and you're not supposed to be, you know, being overly dramatic. You're supposed to be real. Right. Well, at the end of the apocalypse commercial, one of the guys, when they can't find, you know, one of the dudes is missing, and they're like, where is he? And they're like, nope, he didn't make it. He wasn't driving the world's most dependable <laughs> dependable truck. You know, and they just, he delivered it so well. He's like, he was driving a Ford. <laughs> yeah, I, so, I thought that was perfect delivery, almost because, because they weren't trying, you know, it was so obvious in that one moment. Everything else, I mean, the whole commercial is over the top in a really great way. Yeah. Um, because they're up front with the fact that they're clearly advertising Chevy, right? Like, the whole world has collapsed. Big Boy is on its side, on fire. Like, and the Chevy, like, revs up and makes it. So you already know this is going to be an oversell. And yeah. then they come into this, you know, casual sort of 
funny meeting and then the guys are you know you can tell they're having their banter but then he goes right into the commercial uh lingo and i think yeah. it's yeah. humorous yeah. because they're authentic about it it's almost tongue in cheek the way he delivers that i thought that was really really cool and then with the box of twinkies so what's the deal with that zoe how or holly what is, how can they put another product in they, they have to get you know, permission or how does that work with hostess? (laughs) Oh yeah, definitely, definitely permission, but maybe even money. I mean, I think, um, you know, the more constrained our resources become uh, and the more expensive the way we try to reach people becomes, I think this kind of strategic partnership is, in my opinion, the, the wave of of the future, not just in advertisement, but in services. I think we should have far more partnerships among companies to be creative together, to, you know, to tell their stories together. I agree. I think it's not only economical, but let's be honest. I think everybody was devastated earlier this year when the, you know, there was a big buzz about like the possibility of Twinkies like not existing anymore because Hostess was having financial troubles. And I almost feel like this was a shout out of like Chevy. We keep all the things you love alive, you know, about <laughs> about America. Like too. Yeah. About America. Very, yeah. It was very Chevy of them to shout out to America, like with the Twinkies and, and yeah. so supportive of Hostess who, you know, the ad community at least knows has been through like some serious trials this year okay I didn't and see I didn't know that about Twinkies and I was actually just thinking to myself um the only thing I might be concerned about if I was hostess was you know I think Twinkies get a bad rep for not having any kind of natural anything (laughs) in them and the fact that they weren't destroyed uh, (laughs) by the Mayan apocalypse that they survived like a Chevy um you know maybe too many preservatives I don't know well, I love that because I do think that's that's some flack that they were getting. And it's funny because I think in an instance like that, you know, we were talking about the Viagra thing earlier. We were talking about the connotation of different products and whether they embrace it or throw it away. And I feel like this was kind of Hostess's opportunity to say, you know, we've heard the joke that there's nothing real in Twinkies and that we'll survive the apocalypse. You know, here, here's, here's us enjoying that, you know, like yeah, here's us saying, yeah, yeah. Making yeah, fun but, of themselves, which is an interesting uh, idea, right, for advertising, an interesting uh, way to go. I think so. I, but, oh, actually, speaking of which, Jill, especially because I know this is of your era and definitely of mine and possibly Zoe's as well. It the is. Matthew, the Matthew Broderick. Um, loved oh, it. Yeah. The, the Ferris yeah. Bueller shout out. Oh, <laughs> Ferris. Great. Yeah, I, I can't wait to watch that live during the Super Bowl. <laughs> I just actually, and I just heard from from a marketing woman here at Olin that that actually that commercial was, and this is you know hearsay, but was purportedly the idea of a former WashU graduate. Oh, Woo! Great. <laughs> so, but no, I thought that was clever and funny and well done, and I just I laughed the whole time. <laughs> I don't yeah. know that it did a terrific job with the CRV until maybe the very end. I don't know that it sold me on the CRV as much as it sold me on how funny he is. But right, so that so, so for a serious question about about advertising, Zoe, what what happens when the the character that the ad is written about or that features is sort of takes over, you know, overshadows the product. And, and is that something that corporations try to be careful about? Carrie, you know, I, I think they, sh- I think they should be aware of it, but then it's also about consistency, right? It's the gecko for Geico, like right, right. stick those two together and you're close enough that you're going to hold on to that. Um, same with the Aflac duck. Yeah, um, yeah. But what I think fascinating is to compare actually the sonic video of the skydiving car with the broderick video which was funny and definitely engaging and i think they're gonna get great great response from that video especially because their target demographic that probably is the older person who can relate back to the bueller days right um but is trying to live a more modern life but you look at the difference and, you know, in Sonic, the car is is the star. The car is the one jumping out the plane. And it's not somebody driving it that's the star. So I think it's interesting to think about that. 
I'm definitely with you on that, Zoe, because I feel like, for me, I loved that Matthew Broderick commercial, but it made me want to go watch Ferris Bueller again. It didn't make me want to buy a CRV. Right. right. I agree. It makes me want, right, it makes me want Ferris Bueller. <laughs> I mean, I I, like you said, I think Honda will see good returns, but I think I think Chevy's probably going to see more. Off. I think it'll be interesting to look at the sales data after the Super Bowl. Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting what they were what they were going for with the Broderick ad, which is tapping into all those people who used to relate to Broderick in his time. And they fast forwarded it to who was that, you know, our demographic now, what would they have looked like basically 20 years ago? And now what do they look like? And let's have their same icon come back and be them now and relate to that nostalgia and that history. I think that's a clever idea. I'm interested to see how it'll pan out. I also, I think if, I think it might've been even a little bit more successful if they had maybe the, you know, the big, the big iconic scene with the car in the Ferris Bueller movie that they recreated with the CRV at the end where they do the, where the guy, the, you know, valet guy gets really stoked to take the car and then jumps it, you know, yep. I think if that had come earlier or maybe been sort of a bigger moment in the commercial, Agreed. I think it, it would have really translated, and they've really given it a money shot with the CRV logo and stuff. I think I would have been a little more before it as an actual ad campaign. Like yeah, it's it almost like a stronger ending to it to stick the brand, right? Yeah, it was. It was actually. I was. It was funny as I was watching that commercial. I was, you know, almost near the end, and I thought to myself, "What are we advertising again?" And then there was that final shot, and I thought, "Okay, they've pulled it t together there." But an advertisement's not necessarily going to capture audience attention the entire time. And so if you only have one money shot, that's a pretty big risk reward payoff. I would agree. I would completely agree. So moving on to a different brand, Coca-Cola. Zoe, I wanted to get your take on, so there's a new one going to play that's the polar bears playing football. And Holly, you mentioned they're going to, they may change, they'll, they'll, that'll be an ongoing story throughout the big game and then have kind of a conclusion uh, during because if one of the last. you can afford to do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I just wondered about those polar bears. So they've become sort of characters for Coke. And then they're also now Coke, the corporation has, the Coca-Cola Corporation has spun that into a cons conservation, right, for actual polar bears. So do you know anything about that or do you have any opinions? Um, I know a little about it. They actually launched a, a large part of this campaign in um, October in Portland at the Net Impact Conference, which I attended. And I, you know, I have to say, I think it's, um, I mean, I'm glad to save polar bears, but Coke's effort towards social responsibility is something I'm incredibly skeptical of at a pretty, <laughs> like, deep level. I mean, I honestly believe, it's not that I believe there shouldn't be Coca-Cola, but I honestly believe that Coca-Cola gives a lot of people diabetes. You know, I think about the campaigns that Budweiser runs in terms of, like, drinking responsibly. I almost feel like Coca-Cola should be running some ads about drinking Coca-Cola responsibly or something. Oh. <laughs> I also think it would be, you know, I know there's a lot of talk these days in business about social responsibility, but I mean, you know, Zoe, how much do you think that would also be a little bit more within their scope of what their product is for? Yeah, that's exactly, actually, I think that's exactly it for me. It seems that the polar bears are their mascot, not that they actually have any polar bears that stay with them on premises or anything, you know, but they've got characters of them, which, you know, certainly aren't, aren't endangered to make a drawing of a polar bear isn't, that's not endangered. And I do feel like there's a problem with the scope here. It doesn't feel really directly aligned with their business or their impact. Yeah. And I, you know, that to me is where it kind of falls short. I agree. I feel like that, that's kind of why I wanted to bring this one up because they're, the polar bears are they're certainly well done in terms of their animation and they're cute and cuddly and you know when you watch them but they're not they, it's almost like a non sequitur with coke and that's exactly what I thought about it and then to then now that they're sort of bridging into this you know polar ice you know the global warming and the polar bears and I was like oh I don't know that it doesn't seem to be a deep 
like a, a really solid bridge. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> the feels like to a nowhere. Stretch. It feels like a stretch. It feels inauthentic. Yeah, and it feels, you know, like I said, if they actually had polar bears on premises and they could say, "Oh my God, we love our polar bears," you know, maybe I'd think a little differently about it. But they make these characters up. They're not real, and so no amount of whatever impact that. So that I think is part of why it feels inauthentic uh, to me. But also, you know, we're in one of our most historically warm winters ever, um, which I know relates to global warming, but it makes it really hard to connect with a polar bear. Yeah. yeah that's true. Well, also, you know, this is not Coke's first kind of misstep with the polar bears. They created a can earlier this year. And, you know, Coke fans are serious about their Coke. They're serious about the design. They're very serious about the branding. Um, you know, Interbrand ranked them the most recognizable brand in the world. They have the most brand equity of any other company. And wow. it's a delicate situation. Oh, yeah, it's serious. It's a delicate situation for them because they created these white cans. Yeah, they went to the white year. cans. Yeah. And people were getting upset because they said it looked like Diet Coke or it looked like another soda. And so actual Coke users are always looking for that red can with the iconic logo. Right. And I feel like Coke needs to kind of go back to back to square one a little bit with who they are because they are the most valued brand in the world. And you can't you can't take a lot of risks with a brand like that as much as you want to. And I mean, I'm all for that's the hard part, though, Zoe, is I'm with you. I'm all for saving the polar bears. But you, you got to understand what your core competencies are and you got to be responsible about how you tie your social initiatives into your brand. And, you know, I think it's a hard thing. I was actually I was in a course this weekend about um, management and corporate responsibility. And we were discussing the Fiji water company and they were trying to make a play. A, this is a while ago. They're trying to make a play that drinking bottled water was good for the environment so long as you drank Fiji because they planted enough trees that their water was actually carbon negative. But the fact is that's not true. And I think people can sense the inauthenticity. Yeah, that, I can't believe they're with all those plastic bottles, they're trying to claim that they're carbon negative. <laughs> right, and I think, you know, I think Coke's going to be up against the same problem. The problem is Coke's product isn't good for the world. It's not. But, you know, we still like it. So... Sometimes I think that you have to be really careful about your messaging and how you're going about it and trying not to claim to be more than what you actually are. And I love just jumping back to that Budweiser drink responsibly. You know, I have I agree with you about that. I have been impressed with with that, with the fact that they can they can get out their, you know, their product, get out the advertisement and sell it, but then also tag on that social responsibility with, you know, drinking and driving. And, and a lot of, I know a lot of companies, corporations have done that with um, alcohol. And then, so then you've got the Coke with the, you know, childhood obesity and the, the di type 2 diabetes, like you mentioned. And so I, I just wonder if that's something we'll see in the future and how that would be tied in. Because that almost seems like like with alcohol, it's drinking to excess that causes the main problems, right? While right. with some products, like possibly soda, you know, full sugared soda, maybe maybe you don't even have to drink to excess to have that. You know, the, the, the jury's out kind of on that because this soda is so bad for kids. Yeah, and I think that Coke would be really smart to just get really ahead of this issue and be a pioneer in it. I think you look at companies that have been doing that. You look at Walmart and how they've been approaching sustainability. What that means is that now Walmart is, you know, in cahoots with the EPA and the EDF. I'm sorry, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Environmental Defense Fund. You know, they consult with them before they make decisions, which means when regulation comes through, Walmart's front of the pack and they're the ones having the conversations. And I think Coke would be really smart to be having those same conversations with Michelle Obama and asking her about, you know, obesity and what Coke can do to be a good partner in children's health. I, I think that sounds great. And girls, I love where this is going, but obviously I know the two of you both have Super Bowl shindigs to get to. <laughs> so uh, I guess we'll get into our chick news for this week. And uh, this week's chick news story involves the woman who broke the Jerry Sandusky story, Sarah Ganim. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Sarah. If not, feel free to come on the show and correct me. I would love that. <laughs> 
Um, she she was working with the uh, Patriot News, which um, obviously is the newspaper there in town. And she was a student. She was 22 years old when she broke this story. And uh, she was the very first person to get an interview with the mother of one of the abused children. And uh, and now she's being nominated for a Pulitzer. That's praise praise to her. Yeah, indeed. I think is it snaps usually though. I'm sorry. (laughs) Give her some snaps. Yeah, some snaps. I have to say, um, such courage and uh, such guts. And I think you know, I actually think this is a really interesting aspect for a lot of things to do with chick news and all of this. Um, You know, journalism. I guess, what was it, 40 years ago, there were hardly any women in the field at all. Um, and I'm not sure that had there not been a woman on this story, it would have ever gotten broken. This is, a, this is a story that, you know, with the mother coming out, I mean, I think that it had to be, I think it was only found because it was a woman that, so, that was searching for it. I really do. And she was a 22-year-old woman, which which is amazing. Like she wasn't like she had kids of her own or had, you know, had been able to be in that, uh, in that period of life where you're kind of, you're, you're protective, you know, in that mode, she was a young woman who just, she, it's like, she used her nose, you know, like the old, the time journalism and she followed the lead. Yeah. And I also have to say, I saw, um, the founder of, uh, teach her America speak a couple of years ago. And she said, it's, it, she, she was addressing a group of college graduates, and she said, go do it now. Whatever it is that you're afraid of doing, go and do it now because you're young enough that you're naive enough that you don't realize all the repercussions. And I actually think that that's probably true here, too. I think this girl was young enough. You know, she sort of might have been luckily a bit naive as to some of the backlash that could have happened, and she didn't have a huge career that was writing on this. Um, You know, I think it was, I just really applaud her courage. Yeah, and maybe the fact that she was a little less emotionally, you know, again, being kind of at that stage and age of life and sort of just being able to go get it and not, like you said, not worry about repercussions. Um, it's, it's really uh-huh. interesting that you brought that up, actually, Zoe, because her mentor um, at the time was uh, was the professor who worked on the newspaper. And when asked about this, as she was nominated for the Pulitzer, when being asked about this scenario and what advice he gave her, he said it was actually really difficult for him because he actually thought about the HIPAA oath and he thought, first, do no harm. And he thought, I wanted to give her all of this advice, but I didn't want to harm the story. I didn't want to harm her resolve. I didn't want to harm her willingness to do this. And so it was. he was very cautious about kind of just letting her do what she was doing, even though he knew it was potentially dangerous, because he didn't want to harm her story. He wanted to let this story get released. And I think it's important kind of that he stepped out of the way, because I think it is like you said, Zoe. I think there were a lot of, and I hate to say it, but I think a lot of men at the time who were being bullied by Sandusky and were being bullied by Paterno and were being bullied by the school because of their involvement with the program and with the process, who didn't want to lose their jobs, who were afraid to look deeper. Yeah. I also have to say, I think this is yet another amazing example of the power of, of journalism and media and um, to both of your credit for, you know, continuing to pursue the dialogue of that and, and create, a, create a voice of, you know, critique and discussion and make it publicly available. I think it's invaluable. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> I, uh, I think, you know what, Jill, we don't have to ask her what crashing glass means to her because I think she just told us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that she did. Zoe, thank you so much. We are... We are mad chicks today. We are just, you know, going off after the Mad Men advertising executives. We are, we could be right there. <laughs> could be. I, I have to say, I'm not mad yet. We'll see about the Super Bowl and how that goes. But I'm kind of glad, chick, right now. Well, I'm going to, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to end uh, with a quote actually from the Glamour article. Uh, the writer was Liz Brody. And uh, the quote about Sarah Gannon from one of the judges who gave her actually Um, the Sydney Award for Socially Conscious Journalism this year said, Sarah Gannon had the guts to take on the most powerful institutions in her community, and she won. And so this week, and she won, should be our our winning battle cry. Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect, Molly. Thanks. Well, have a great Super Bowl, girl. I'll talk to you later this week. Yeah, happy big game. I'm breathing fire. I'm bearing That you're bleeding I'm choking up now
just one.